evening. So today we publish the Military Balance 2023 and deliver conclusions from our Military Balance Plus database in a year dominated by Russia's ill-judged decision to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So far, the war has been a political and military failure for Russia. Moscow hoped its forces would sprint to victory, but they are in a grinding war. The invasion has recast the security environment in Europe. The geopolitical center of gravity has moved to the east and to the north. NATO has found renewed purpose and will almost certainly in 2023 gain two new members in Finland and Sweden. Sharpened security fears have led several European states to renew their defense spending commitments and focus on improved military capabilities. Ukraine has become Europe's front line. Russia's initial campaign plan was founded on a mixture of underestimation and overconfidence. The resistance of Ukraine's armed forces and leaders and the resilience of its population proved key to thwarting Russia's plans. Vitally important was Western training and equipment support since 2014. Key also was the decision by Western states to send additional military supplies to Ukraine before 24 February and to ramp up support afterwards. Western assistance has also been essential in maintenance and repair and in intelligence support. The extent and level of continued Western engagement will, of course, determine whether Kyiv is able to forestall further advances by Moscow's forces or even remove them from Ukrainian territory. In contrast for Russia, events on the battlefield have called into question the effectiveness of the post-2008 new look military modernization process. In its first real combat test against a determined conventional opponent, Moscow's armed forces have so far come up short, particularly its ground forces. These were the least modern of Russia's armed forces by its own metrics, but there are also important questions to be raised about aspects of Russia's naval and air power. The early loss of the cruiser Moskva was extraordinary, and shortfalls were soon exposed in Russia's long and medium-range air-to-surface weapons. Moscow's plans to generate an army based on contract personnel have suffered. The loss of many of its experienced troops in the war's early phases led Moscow to mobilize. In time, this plugged the gap, but it could not adequately replace experience. Russia remains intent on building up personnel strength for new offensives. Now, Russia's actions over the past year have raised questions not only over the competence of its military and senior military leadership, but also over command cohesion. There are reports of internal conflicts and the regular sacking of military leaders, while Russia's leadership also turned to the Wagner Group to supplement Russia's weakened ground forces. The quality of Russia's lower level military leadership is low, highlighting the lack of an effective cadre of non-commissioned officers. Russian forces have shown some battlefield adaptation, including the integration of the Wagner Group and of Iranian weapons. They nevertheless have relied on Russia's 20th century military history for inspiration, using the mass provided by personnel and artillery heavy assaults to grind out victories on the battlefield. As Russia and Ukraine fight in 2023, Russia will be using an inventory that has changed significantly over the year. Around 50% of its pre-invasion fleet of modern T-72B3s and T-72B3M main battle tanks is assessed to have been lost. The 4th Guards Tank Division, equipped with a T-80U, suffered heavily in February, March 2022, and Russia's inventory of T-80BVU tanks is estimated to have been reduced by two-thirds. Industrial production continues but remains slow, forcing Moscow to rely on its oldest stored weapons as attrition replacements. The need to re-equip during war raises questions over the direction and durability of Russia's state armaments program and its future military modernization ambitions. Ukraine's weapons inventory is also changing. Combat losses led Kyiv to secure supplies of Soviet-era weapons from East European states. But a search for improved capability and awareness that Soviet-era stocks in Europe are finite has seen Kyiv seek additional equipment of Western origin. Its artillery holdings are particularly transformative. 
Western designed 155 millimeter guns and rocket artillery mean its army can now strike at long range with more precise projectiles. Ukraine's forces also demonstrate adaptation in war and decentralization of command. While threats from Russian artillery have forced R Ukraine's artillery to disperse to avoid destruction, persistent battlefield surveillance and improved communications have nonetheless enabled Ukrainians effectively to concentrate their artillery fire. The supply to Ukraine of older Soviet-era equipment by East European states is accelerating the modernization of these countries' inventories as they re-equip with Western-made systems. It is also creating opportunities to improve equipment commonality in Europe. Western defense firms are facing the challenge and opportunity of replacing assets transferred to Ukraine while at the same time meeting changing military requirements. The United States has supplied the most, cementing its position as central in Europe's defense. The debate in Germany over the supply of Leopard main battle tanks to Ukraine perhaps overshadowed other supplies by Berlin, including of air defense systems. Finland and Poland, reflecting their new frontline status, became powerful campaigners for the delivery of NATO standard main battle tanks. Weapon supplies to Ukraine have varied in volume, reflecting different risk assessments in Europe. In January, Denmark pledged all of its Cesar artillery pieces, while Baltic states have donated large parts of their inventories over the last year. Other European governments have argued further equipment transfers to Ukraine might undermine their own ability to fulfill NATO collective defense obligations. Overall, the war has highlighted the importance of weapon stocks and defense production capacity. In Western states with reduced weapon stocks, fewer factories and closed production lines, the resilience of their defense industries is being severely challenged. Immediate equipment requirements have led some European states to look to new suppliers beyond domestic or traditional sources. With growing requirements and a pressing schedule, for example, Poland split its orders for tanks and rocket artillery between US and South Korean firms. Moscow, too, has looked to new sources, turning to Tehran for the supply of armed UAVs and direct attack munitions. In exchange, Iran may receive the Su-35 aircraft that Russia had previously earmarked for Egypt, thereby beginning the modernization of Iran's combat air fleet. Iran will have learned from the combat experience of the UAVs and direct attack munitions it has supplied to Russia. Meanwhile, it is assessed that Russia has received military material from North Korea. There has certainly been an increase in Pyongyang's military activity in its own region. In 2022, North Korea launched more ballistic missiles than ever before. For the first time since 2017, Tests included a series of ICBM-related launches, while Pyongyang claimed that a new intermediate-range ballistic missile overflew Japan. At the same time, South Korea and U.S. military exercises increased both in size and complexity. South Korea's armed forces continued to develop their capabilities, and worries grew that Kim Jong-un's regime was in the final stages of planning a seventh nuclear test. Though the US views Russia as an acute threat, China's military modernization remains the Department of Defense's core concern. Fear of China's growing military power is also an important factor influencing military modernization elsewhere in Asia, most notably in Australia and Japan. The AUKUS arrangement is intended not just to provide Australia with a nuclear-powered submarine capability, but also to deepen defense technological cooperation between its three signatories. While defense diplomacy is accelerating on both of these tracks, much remains to be done. Meanwhile, Italy, Japan, and the UK agreed to combine their projects into a single global combat air program. China's military modernization continues apace. It is building its nuclear capabilities and adding new systems in space and on land, sea, and in the air. China's combat aircraft inventory has been transformed over the last five years. Our Military Balance Plus database, uh, 
now shows over 150 J-20A fighter ground attack aircraft in the inventory. At the same time, the US Air Force is increasing its number of F-35As. These now number around 360. But the pace of China's defense industrial output means it is catching up. Indeed, if deliveries continue at the same speed, in 2023, the number of J-20As will eclipse the inventory of the US Air Force's other fifth-generation combat aircraft, the F-22. In 2022, defense policymakers in both the Euro-Atlantic and the Asia-Pacific regions faced competing strategic drivers. The war in Ukraine and growing perceptions of a threat from China pushed defense spending upward, but economic challenges weighed on public spending decisions. These challenges included weak currencies, sluggish economic growth, ongoing supply chain disruption, and soaring inflation. Indeed, while global defense expenditure grew in nominal terms, in 2021 and 2022, higher inflation meant that expenditure fell in real terms in both years. We estimate that in 2022, inflation wiped some 312 billion US dollars off global defense expenditure, up from 222 billion the year before. For some governments, including a number in Europe and Asia, this means that the value of their defense investments is being undercut even as security challenges sharpen. As Washington modernizes its military capabilities yet further, it poses a challenge for its allies and partners. There is worry about whether partners will have access to the full range of capability offered by US weapons, whether these weapons will be affordable, and whether ever greater interoperability is actually achievable. As a result, Allies and partners are also looking to develop groups of like-minded nations to spread the financial burden in producing equipment. This should be in Washington's interest too if it helps its partners to develop and sustain their own defense industrial bases. As the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine nears, nations around the world are looking for the emerging lessons. The war has been infused with technology, yet Ukraine has highlighted the importance of the human factor in war, with leadership, morale, and training proving vital. Mass remains important, and the high rates of attrition observed require governments to set clear priorities rapidly so that defense industry can make the business decisions needed to boost production cap capabilities. It is vital for Ukraine that the US and European states maintain or increase their support even as elections loom. Allies and partners of the US and Europe around the world, as well as opponents, will watch carefully to gauge the durability of Western support and the commitment to defend the European security order. And with that, I'll invite Bastian Giegert to uh, introduce members of our panel. John, thank you very much um, for, for those remarks. Uh, what I will do now is uh, ask four of my colleagues here on the panel to add very brief perspectives on the themes uh, that John has uh, discussed. Uh, we will start with uh, Fenella McCurty, Senior Fellow for Defense Economics. We'll be followed by uh, Maya Nowens, uh, Senior Fellow for Chinese Security and Defense, uh, followed by Douglas Berry, uh, Senior Fellow for Military Aerospace, and Ben Berry, um, senior Fellow for Land Warfare. Uh, we then have uh, also with us on the panel uh, James Hackett, the uh, editor of the Military Balance, Nick Charles, the Senior Fellow for um, uh, Naval Forces, um, and last but certainly not least, Henry Boyd, Research Fellow on the Defense Team uh, and uh, running a lot of our defense uh, data research. Once we've done that, uh, so four interventions, Fenella, Maya, um, Douglas, and Ben, we will take questions. Uh, John will, will uh, moderate the room here. I will look after the online uh, interventions. Uh, we're hovering at around 250 uh, uh, online participants who have started to put their questions in. I'll encourage them to keep doing that, uh, and then we'll, we're ready to engage in discussion. Fenella. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Bastian. So for me, there were four key themes that uh, stood out over the last year in terms of defense economics. Uh, the first, as John mentioned, inflation presented a key challenge uh, for defense policymakers in 2022. Uh, we already saw how much of the funding has been eroded over the last two years, 
Our base year is 2015, but ultimately, whatever year you select, the effect is clear. 2022 was the second consecutive year of real terms contractions in defence spending, despite quite significant nominal uplifts that we saw in several countries. Uh, and those were driven by strategic factors, the war in Ukraine, increased tension in East Asia. So that brings me on to the second theme. So policymakers faced a bit of a balancing act uh, between these strategic drivers pushing defence spending upwards and the economic challenges that weighed down on growth. And the combination of these creates the uh, conflicting public spending priorities. The third theme is the extent of budget revisions that we've seen over the course of 2022. They span the globe. It's, it's not just where you would expect, Russia and Europe, but also countries like Ethiopia, India, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that's where underlying conditions have shifted, either on the, on the strategic side or the economic side. And these revisions served to dramatically alter the trajectory of 2022 defence spending in several of these regions. The final theme is that of transparency. The dramatic uplifts that we saw in some countries were facilitated or supplemented by extra budgetary funds, uh, key examples being the 100 billion euro fund announced in Germany, or Poland's armed forces support fund, uh, also primarily for defense acquisitions. Supplemental budgets also continued to be used in Asia, countries like Japan and Taiwan. And so they do enable more rapid investment in defense, but they also create issues for accountability, transparency, and whether that's ideal right now at a time of heightened uh, geopolitical tensions is, is perhaps questionable. Uh, not only in Asia do you have these tensions, but, uh, but also uh, in Europe, obviously, as well. So looking forward, governments are going to need to continue to balance those threat drivers uh, against the economic realities. Any improvement in the latter, the current projections are that inflation will begin to, to stabilize, and that will help to ease the pressure. But at the moment, Governments are seeing the value of their defence investments uh, undercut, even as security challenges sharpen, both in, in Europe and Asia. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Vastin, as well. So looking at China, I think the last year has, of course, been an ongoing year for military modernization for the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, working towards the ultimate goal of um, full military modernization by 2035. I think over the last year, what's become a little bit more clear is that 2027, this nearer term goal, is one that, at least in capability terms for the People's Liberation Army, um, is one that is more directed towards a, an East Asian, in particular, a Taiwan contingency, um, if that occurs. And that is a capability-driven goal, of course, not a political will-driven goal. At the start of 2022, uh, Xi Jinping called for the PLA to redouble their efforts to be uh, better combine training with combat operations and strengthen systemic uh, training and the use of technologies to develop an elite force. There have also been a succession of changes in military legislation that aim to improve things like oversight and troop management. So a lot happening below the uh, threshold of, of course, uh, just looking at military technology in the PLA. At the 20th Party Congress last year, which was covered extensively, um, new leadership in the Central Military Commission suggested that she continues to prioritize war fighting experience where that exists within PLA leadership, and of course, Taiwan relevant experience as well. Leadership across theater commands, however, at the theater commander level has become uh, one dominated by the PLA ground forces, which should call into question a little bit how far progress um, has been made on in terms of PLA ambitions uh, for a truly joint force. Two other developments uh, were relevant for the PLA in 2022, and these were, of course, the PLA exercises around Taiwan following the visit of then Speaker of the House of the United States, Nancy Pelosi, to Taiwan, while the PLA um, exercised anti-submarine warfare, joint service logistics support, in-flight refueling, aircraft carrier and submarine operations, as well as the firing of ballistic missiles around and over Taiwan, they were likely calibrated to avoid misunderstanding. Um, and of course, it is interesting to look at what wasn't included in those exercises, such as large-scale amphibious exercises. Secondly, the war in Ukraine, of course, has to be mentioned, um, and it posed a political problem for Beijing, who has thus far reportedly not supported Russia's war effort by providing military equipment or weaponry, uh, and is, of course, cautious of crossing red lines and risking secondary sanctions. 
However, the PLA, of course, will have been watching this war um, uh, evolve over the last 12 months very closely with potential lessons learned for a possible contingency on Taiwan, although not all of those lessons are directly transferable. Um, they touch on a wide range of issues with regards to morale or logistics and maintenance, and it should be said that in a number of these areas, the PLA, of course, has been working very hard over the last five to six years to make its own progress. Additionally, Moscow and Beijing uh, continue to remain politically committed to their bilateral military relationship. China and Russia continue to cooperate in the air and maritime domain, particularly in East Asia, and there have been increased um, numbers of uh, joint um, coordinated uh, passages, whether in air or at sea, uh, between the two militaries in the region over the last few years. These exercises are more likely to be coordinated rather than truly joint or integrated, it should be noted. However, they do continue to serve the purpose of political sig signaling in the region, nevertheless. And I'll hand over to Doug. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> returning to uh, Ukraine, uh, I think one of the things that struck, struck us all in the panel has been the high utilization rate, certainly, of air-launched guided weaponry. Um, you see capability gaps and a lack of infantry depth, both in the part of Moscow and Kiev. Uh, Russia's air campaign has been impeded not only by Ukrainian resistance, and it has been pretty successful in that sense, um, but also the Russian Air Force's limited numbers of some classes of precision-guided weapons. Uh, this is most apparent with the Ka-101, which is the very long-range air-launched cruise missile that they've used repeatedly. Um, but the service also lacks certain kinds of tactical air-to-surface weapons. Uh, probably the most important uh, missile absent is a system called the Cath 38 which is a, a short-range uh, tactical air, uh, air launch system. Been in development since the 1980s, but has yet to make it into the inventory in anything like operationally useful numbers. And where the Russian Air Force has actually been more successful is in its threat, um, or the capability it has in medium and long range air to air missiles. Uh, the, we see the Su 35S, the Flanker M, uh, carrying a mix of uh, a missile called the R 77 1, which is the 12B adder, and also the R 37M, uh, which is the A 13 axe head. Uh, the former has a, a range of about 100 kilometres, uh, the R 37M has a, has a significantly longer range. Um, again, like the Cath 38, these, these systems were in development uh, in the 1980s and through the 1990s, uh, but they, they, the Air Force just simply lacked the money to buy them. They did come into service in, in the mid-2010s, uh, and, and they're proving um, effective in, in, in limiting uh, the Ukrainians' ability to use their own air fare. Um, but the, the, the overall limitations in terms of infantry continue uh, to be manifest in the way uh, Russia is having to use its air power uh, during the war. I'll hand over to Ben, thank you. What are the likely contours of the Ukraine war over the next couple of months? Well, at the strategic level, currently the war, war is stalemated with little movement of the front lines. Ukraine plans counteroffensives to eject Russian forces. For these, they want to have at least 10 armored brigades with modern Western armor. Hence their request for a 1,000 modern armoured fighting vehicles. Current declarations by Ukraine's allies would supply about 25% of these by the summer. Moscow seeks to outlast Ukraine and its allies, accepting heavy losses. Its short-term objectives are full control of the Donbass and of the Zaporizhzhia and Kherson oblasts, which they partially control. It's not clear if they can yet concentrate enough capable and competent formations to achieve this. Meanwhile, it will continue both to fortify its defences and to launch First World War-style attritional attacks in the Donbass. We can also expect intermittent Russian missile and drone attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. Spring, of course, will make attacks easier for both sides. Political factors also impel both sides to attack. Whichever side attacks first will get political and military first mover advantages, but will also expose themselves to counterattacks by defenders' artillery and armour. And I'm certain that both sides will be preparing to do this. Now, provided that Ukraine's allies can supply sufficient ammunition and equipment, 
political and battlefield leadership, as well as Western weapons, may well give Ukraine tactical advantage. But it's not clear to me that Kiev has enough combat power to rapidly eject Russian forces. So, we must remember that hundreds of thousands of people have been killed or seriously injured in this war. We can expect another bloody year with unpredictable action-reaction dynamics as both sides struggle for the initiative at the strategic, operational and tactical levels. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone will migrate to anyone who's grabbed my uh, attention. And there's the first, if you could stand, I know you're carrying a laptop, but if, if you could stand, then the microphone will come to you even quicker, I hope. Uh, up the center aisle here. Yep, right there. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, one country, uh, George Grills from the Times, one, one country you haven't mentioned is, is the UK. What, what's your assessment of the, UK, the state of the UK's armed forces, given the recent admissions that it's unable to field a, a war fighting division? Uh, you know, the UK is the second largest uh, spender on defense in NATO. D does it have the second most powerful military? Thanks. Ben Barry. Well, France and Germany have militaries that in some respects are larger, although there's been plenty of media reporting about poor levels of readiness in the German, German armed forces. Um, the UK has pretty capable Navy and Air Force, and across its forces, it's also well balanced between combat, combat support, logistics, and strategic lift in a way that not many other expeditionary armed forces are. And its armed forces still have a combat culture and an expeditionary mind mindset. But they're now very, very small, and they can't be in two places at once. The integrated review was based on an assumption of a move from sunset capabilities to so-called sunrise capabilities. Uh, some of those sunset capabilities, like heavy armor, um, have proven themselves to have quite a lot of utility in Ukraine. And Ukraine poses uncomfortable questions in terms of the size of the British stockpiles of spare parts and ammunition and its ability to sustain a high intensity of combat. It also poses uncomfortable questions, particularly for the army, which is much less modernised than the Na Navy or the Air Force. So I'd say the jury's out. If the plans the MOD has come to fruition, some of these deficits will be tackled, but not all of them. And whether they'll be tackled quickly enough, that's an open question. Thank you. Yes, Robert Fox, I think. You, you still have to stand up, though, Robert. Uh, uh, uh. Sorry, John, thank you very much. Um, follows on from that, and it will be Ben, I think, uh, amongst others, I'm sorry, is Vilnius. What do you expect to come out of that in terms of a new NATO concept? Are they going to be able to fulfill the wish or the pledge to have 300,000 plus readily mobilizable troops? Bastian, do you want to take a quick? Bastian, do you yeah, do I'll, I'll start on that and then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see who wants to come in. So I think what is important to remember about, the, uh, about NATO's new force model, um, which, which is where the, where the number comes from that you, that you just quoted, um, is that uh, if you go by the old standard of the um, uh, enhanced NATO response force, it is an increase of around 700%, uh, 750%. Now, I know uh, the 300,000 in the new NATO force model is not the equivalent of just a, a seven, seven and a half times bigger NATO response force, but nevertheless, it's a useful reference point because the challenge will be um, uh, that a, a large number of these will have to be European because I don't see the U.S. changing its force posture in any, any meaningful well to, way to sustain this larger uh, uh, ambition. Um, uh, so I think the, uh, the risk for NATO is that what happens, that, that uh, uh, what happened in the past might happen again, where, um, where uh, NATO member states make uh, commitments on paper that are then not underpinned by, the, uh, by earmarked uh, assets to move these at speed, um, uh, uh, and make sure that the military mobility is there and other enablers are, are there. Uh, now, what is, of course, different from 
uh, the days of the 430s and, and all these, uh, you know, the NATO Readiness Initiative and the things that came before uh, is that the threat perception is much clearer and, and I think therefore there will be a, a higher focus, but I would say um, it remains uh, very challenging. Uh, it is worth uh, pointing out that the ambition that NATO has set itself there is meant to be achieved over the next couple of years, so not it, I don't think it will be a, a Vilnius uh, uh, announcement. So, Ben, I don't know whether you want to add or, or others want to come in. Bastian's made the key points. The other point for NATO is that our work previously, before the attack on Ukraine, showed that NATO had considerable deficiencies in combat support in those critical enablers, like ground-based air defence, uh, like military bridging, like military ISR, and it's not clear from the new force model what the targets are for those enablers, bearing in mind that governments and defence ministries tend to default towards shop window stuff rather than those critical enablers. Thank you. Yes, you please. If you... Thank you very much. Hi, Liz Higgerberg from the Sydney Morning Herald. It's becoming a bit of a debate in the UK about whether the uh, military is resourced well enough to justify Indo-Pacific tilt. What is your assessment of whether it can? We did a lengthy study of this, which we published about six months ago, which is still on, on our website. Um, the drivers for the tilt are quite clear, including geoeconomics and reassuring the UK's allies and trading partners in the, in the region, as well as being seen to support uh, the actions of US, the US and Australia. Um, but those UK armed forces are very, very small, and elements that are doing, the, doing what some advocates would like them to do in the Indo-Pacific won't be in Europe, where there is this clear and present danger, which was recognised by the inter integrated review. And I think this is a really hard question for this refresh of the, of the integrated review that's, that's going on. Because if the UK were to do more, it would have to do more of substance. So it would have to have the logistics and the ammunition and the strategic lift. And getting them to any sort of um, operation in the Indo-Pacific is really challenging with that regard. I don't know if Nick yeah. wants to talk about the maritime aspects. Nick? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I absolutely endorse everything that, that, that Ben mentioned. Um, and you know, a, a key issue uh, from the outset, really, as far as the Indo-Pacific tilt was concerned, when even, even when it was rolled out, uh, there was a, 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 an additional uh, codicil that uh, the, uh, the Euro-Atlantic remained, remained the primary uh, focus. Um, so there has always been a question of whether this can be delivered in a credible way and, and, and whether um, uh, essentially it, it adds up. There is a trajectory, particularly as far as uh, naval and maritime uh, capabilities are concerned to build build this up over time from to 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 OPVs to re-establish a presence, gain greater awareness, uh, establish um, a, a, a more of a, a diplomatic role, to to something more in in, in terms of uh, a persistent capability with with, with frigates and, and and so on, um, with uh, you know an occasional uh, surge of 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 higher end capabilities. Those are all premised on a a continuing uh, focus, uh, but also uh, the sustainment of promised investment, uh, those, those need to be delivered. So, so in a way, um, the dilemma has been sharpened. Uh, having said that also, particularly from a naval and maritime perspective, one of the uh, broad lessons out of uh, Ukraine um, I, I would argue uh, in terms of such things as uh, food security, energy security, is that there, there is an interconnectedness uh, which, if you like, drives home the rationale. There are uh, elements that are um, in the works in terms of uh, the UK's posture that uh, might add motivation and encouragement. Uh, for example, the, the defense industrial uh, link-ups that, that we've seen already in terms of GCAP, uh, but also uh, hanging out there uh, and, and potentially significant as far as the UK's stake in an ability to deliver on a commitment into the Indo-Pacific is what comes out of the whole AUKUS process, first in terms of the submarine capability, uh, uh, but also in terms of everything that then follows on from that. 
I would just add a couple of sentences that, um, to use a Chinese phrase, um, the European security order is a core interest of the West, and if the West isn't able to prevail in securing this European security order, uh, the reassurance to those in the Indo-Pacific will be diluted. So those in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and also for that matter, traditional partners and friends in the Middle East have an interest uh, in uh, the West prevailing in Europe if they still continue to expect uh, similar commitments to their own uh, regions. So the interconnectedness is even more important there. I think I saw a question from this part. Yes, please, if you could. And then we might take a question online after. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the analysis, of course, is excellent from the double IDLS, but you're, you're also very well known for your inventory information. Uh, can I just ask how you kept ahead of what's going on in Ukraine with regard to your inventories, how you've rationalized that, that you and how you sort about freezing that in time for the publication of the hard copy? Well, thank you very much. We kind of knew that question would arise, uh, so I hope we're prepared for it. Um, uh, James Hackett first, and then Henry Boyd. Okay, thanks. I mean, it's, uh, it is, of course, a, a, a very difficult moving target. Um, I think one of the interesting points out of this campaign, uh, this ongoing war, has been the proliferation of imagery and open source imagery that's out there. That's created a, a, a challenge for us because those sources see what they see. They don't necessarily see what's happening in other uh, aspects of the campaign. And I think that uh, that's led, leads to um, a difficulty and a challenge in in uh, assessing force breakdowns, let's say. And Henry can talk a little in more detail uh, and more clarity about this in a minute. Uh, for instance, uh, we are able to assess the, the uh, uh, T72, B3, B3M loss rate, uh, as John indicated in the press statement. But it's far harder then to assess the, uh, the variants of T62, T64s that the Russians might be looking to, uh, to put in from their, their stocks, uh, the older systems and also those systems that were used by forces in, away from the north, the, the uh, attacks that were most heavily photographed and heavily covered. Um, for instance, in the south, uh, troops using, uh, coming in from the southern military district, etc. It's relatively easier for air forces because a lot of those uh, numbers have been tracked. You can tra track the, uh, the, the, um, the bought numbers of downed Russian aircraft. But even then, there are complications in terms of rotary wing assets. Uh, if anything, uh, this war has highlighted, I think, the, um, as Douglas and I were talking about the other day, uh, the, the difficulty of uh, rotary wing in a land, land attack environment when you're faced with uh, a contested uh, air defense environment. But it's been a difficulty for us. We have to draw a line somewhere, and we did that on the, in November last year. Um, the database will already be different uh, because we are assessing these numbers on a more routine basis from that. But we still have, have tracked uh, a significant reduction in Russia's main battle tank fleet and also in their armored fighting vehicle fleet. That, again, is harder to assess than main battle tanks. Uh, still harder to assess is the artillery holdings um, because they're often further back from the front line and will uh, receive little, little of, or fewer, um, uh, less imagery cover in open source. Nonetheless, we've made assessments uh, on those losses um, but there's much more granularity in terms of the breakdown for the more modern T-72, uh, T-80 T fleets, as John indicated in the statement. Henry, over to you. Thanks. I uh, hopefully won't bore you with a long rendition of Excel spreadsheets and various formulaic attempts at kind of comparing individual unit loss rates with kind of expected averages, but there is a lot of work that had to go into trying to make an, an informed judgment on an incredible open source judgment about overall rates of loss for things like main battle tanks based upon how many we think they started with, of which types, which units had them, how heavily involved individual units were in the fighting, um, what has happened to that over time, which units have been resupplied and with what equipment, um, what capacity Russia has had to reactivate damaged equipment or, re or put, put captured Ukrainian equipment back into service. Um, very broadly speaking, um, I, th I would say that the... Uh, the level of precision you can achieve in wartime in terms of casualty rates is going to be more, much more challenging than a more static peacetime figure, um, simply because of the dynamic nature of losses and replacements. 
um, but it's still, there is still a sufficient quantity of open source evidence, albeit partial, for um, a solid analytical methodology to make a kind of credible, a credible estimate based upon. And we're not the only organization attempting this at the moment. You can probably see in, in various sort of, um, what kind of, from time to time, um, open source statements from um, ministries of defense and intelligence communities are their own assessments of loss rates. The Ukrainians themselves continue to publish their own figures um, for Russian loss rates, which are uh, substantially in excess of visually reported um, Russian losses in terms of equipment. Um, for my own, um, from perspective of myself and my analytical team, I would suggest you're, 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 you are perhaps in a kind of Goldilocks method looking at the figure somewhere in between the, um, the visually reported as a kind of a baseline and a Ukrainian figure that looks while kind of, it's, it's high, maybe not implausibly so, but certainly at the high end of what I would say is a realistic estimate for total losses. Um, to just as a kind of a, a rough comparison, can to the, I think we're about 1,700 visually identified Russian tank losses, Russian and um, Russian separatist, Russian backed separatist forces and Wagner total. Um, I would suspect the, act, the actual figure is somewhere between 20 and 40% higher than that. Um, there's a kind of an estimated range there of about 2,000, 2,300 overall losses. Um, again, that figure, as James indicated, is going to is is going to be dynamic over the, over the course of months. Um, and while it has, while Russia's loss rate in terms of armored fighting vehicles has slowed down somewhat over the winter, um, as much as a result of um, the, a lower their lower inventory numbers now than it, than a kind of a reduction in the intensity of fighting. Um, a larger scale offensive potentially later this year would probably result in an increase in that rate. And so that's something that um, both myself and my team are kind of tr keep trying to keep track of on a on a day-to-day -day basis to review our own assumptions and, method and kind of methodological calculations and to maybe uh, to keep a kind of a a running assessment, as it were, in terms of what we how, how we think our, our own estimates stack up to facts on the ground. So it's safe to say this is an area where the methodology, too, is dynamic, uh, but hopefully best practice at any given moment. Bastian? Thank you very much. Let's turn to um, uh, one or two of the about 30 questions that the 260 people online have so far generated. So uh, the first one uh, I wanted to uh, uh, call on uh, is on, on defense economics. So I'm going to uh, turn to Fenella. There's a question on the impact the conflicts in the in the last year had on defense spending in the in the Gulf region, um, uh, and uh, what kind of link we see between a move towards greater self-reliance um, and indigenous production in the region, and and uh, so the localization of defense spending and, and overall outlays. Fenella. Thanks, Bastian. So I think coming into 2022, regional spending uh, was, was fairly static, actually, and declining in real terms. Um, there was that focus on diverse diversification. Uh, but then over the course of 2022, everything kind of shifted. Uh, oil price surged. Um, we saw surpluses um, get to a distinctly healthy rate. Uh, so countries could either insert some resilience into public financing uh, or look to bolster de uh, to defense spending. Um, a key example of that dramatic in-year revision uh, that, I, that I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks was, was Saudi Arabia. Um, we saw a dramatic uplift in their, their planned defense budget uh, for 2022, uh, only revealed towards the end of the year. Um, and that had the effect of turning the regional trend from a 2% real reduction into a 9% real uplift. So that shows the, the sort of key role that sort of Saudi Arabia plays in uh, total regional spending. Um, and in terms of, of self-sufficiency, I think one area that um, we, we've uh, highlighted in, in previous research was the uh, focus on um, whether these countries are allocating enough within the, the defense budget towards R&D in order to fulfill these self-sufficiency goals uh, and indigenization. So with this uplift and uh, with this um, greater capacity that these countries now have in terms of public finances, we might now see a return uh, or a refocus on R&D within defense spending rather than just um, bolstering off-the-shelf purchases. Um, that said, I think countries will still start to look at uh, how to create some resilience within uh, their, their 
that within their public finances. Oil prices are, of course, incredibly volatile and subject to external factors that these countries can't often um, control. Certainly over the last few years, it's been by external factors, by the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so in that sense, I think countries have started to um, reconfigure how they adjust their public finances in, in, in regards to the oil price and create some resilience uh, to shifts. Um, so we, we'll, it's likely that we'll see uh, more countries starting to do that with this greater uh, fiscal surpluses that they now have. Thanks. Thank you, Vanilla. I'll, I'll take one more from the uh, online uh, group before we return to the room. Uh, this one is for, for Douglas. Um, uh, Douglas, there have been uh, media reports that Russia is massing helicopters and aircraft uh, at the border uh, with Ukraine, and that the next step, uh, sorry, the next stage uh, of the campaign may lean heavily on on air power. Uh, would that do you share that assessment? Uh, what what can you say about the ability uh, of of Russia to do that? In terms of the Air Force's capability to actually exert influence to a greater extent than it has so far, I think the answer is yes, obviously. Uh, they still have uh, most, of the, most of their capabilities intact, unlike the ground forces. In terms of the, the, the suggested massing of fixed and rotary wing assets, um, we've yet to see evidence of that, but obviously we haven't had, had access to up-to-date, uh, well, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, within the last 72 hours kind of satellite imagery. Uh, once we access that, hopefully we'll be able to see whether or not this is the case. Uh, it may simply be that uh, aircraft and helicopters are being moved around. It wouldn't be the first time we've seen this. Uh, you see, you see uh, material move between base to base. In terms of how the Russians might use it, obviously if the Ukrainians... Um, consolidate a force anywhere on the ground, then you, you present a, a particularly attractive target from a, from, a, from a Moscow perspective. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Norman Newman from Shepard Media. Uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, I'd like to bring China back a little. Um, how much do you think China can become a problem uh, for Europe in the context of the Ukrainian war? And second of all, you know, as a couple of you mentioned, the PLEs continue, you know, PLA continues to grow and modernize. And as uh, no one's mentioned, uh, it has invested more in training. What's the current level of assessment of China's readiness and preparedness if we compare it to, to Russia's obvious underperformance in Ukraine? Thank you. I think Mayor Nguyen is ready for that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two great questions. Uh, in terms of how much of a problem your, uh, China can become for Europe uh, on the war of Ukraine, I think the latest news uh, about China potentially, um, or Chinese companies rather, potentially um, uh, shipping uh, components uh, to Russian defense industrial uh, industry um, via third countries is uh, a concern here. Um, I'm not quite sure what the latest news on that, however, is, as we've uh, yet to find out more uh, information about that. And of course, understand where the U.S. is currently thinking of going in terms of potentially um, expanding um, secondary sanctions to China as a result. So we haven't seen any follow-up on that um, story since it was uh, since it was released. Um, I think, uh, from my perspective, we'll see China continue to be cautious with regards to its support uh, of Russia on the war in Ukraine, definitely in terms of direct military support. Um, I really think the focus here for China is to get the PLA uh, ready for uh, any contingency on its east coast. Um, uh, and that is going to be, uh, has already been mentioned by um, the PLA and by the Central Military Commission and the um, the, uh, the CCP, uh, of course, Taiwan is a core uh, core interest, and it will remain so for the next few years. Um, in terms of um, Chinese war readiness, I think that's an excellent question, and I think we we just don't have an understanding yet of um, how things like command and control would work in a crisis scenario. We see a lot of exercises in China that, of course, occur during peacetime, and they're reported to occur uh, to progress. Um, smoothly, um, and yet we still don't understand how that necessarily will work under pressure um, uh, and in um, a, a high-intensity environment. Um, I don't think that they necessarily have a good understanding of that themselves, 
uh, either. So certainly for the next year, what we'll be watching is uh, the types of exercises that are going to be held, who's going to be involved in them from different service branches, how joint they're going to be, and of course, uh, the conditions in which, under which they try to exercise those. Thank you. And one more from the room, then we'll take one more online. We might close there unless I see a burst of activity. There we go. Hi, uh, Ilya Antipo from Bloomberg News. Uh, I was wondering which uh, uh, defense lines are better right now, Russians or Ukrainians? We're talking about defensive capabilities. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about your assessment of the defense capabilities of both sides? Because if we're looking at the war of attrition and the And um, what about Ukrainian manpower? Because we hear a lot of uh, about Western support, but at least if you quantity of it, it's more or less um, calculatable. But uh, again, as you mentioned, you have a pretty good understanding of what the situation on the Russian side is. Um, but what are the Ukrainian manpower? Because this is probably where the Ukraine has less resources than Russia. Thank you. Ben, strength of defensive lines and availability of manpower. Um, I might call on Henry for the manpower um, side. On defensive, defensive lines, we can be absolutely certain that Ukraine has prepared a defence in depth and that it's probably concentrated its armoured units and formations as counterattack for forces. And indeed, um, I imagine the Ukrainian command would let a serious Russian offensive advance into their territory, inflicting attrition with artillery fire and anti-tank fire, and would then use its armour uh, to deliver decisive counterattacks before going over to the counteroffensive. I'm pretty certain that if the Russian command is applying its own military doctrine, it will be seeking to do the same. Now, Ukrainian operational security isn't giving us an idea of the, the defences in, in depth, although journalists are going to the front, the front line. What we do know from civilian satellite imagery is that at great effort, Russia has been building big linear networks of anti-tank defences, dragon's teeth ditches, and also creating sort of all-round defensive hodge, hed, hedgehogs at key road junctions and towns. What we can't see is the extent to which both sides have actually fortified town, towns, and, towns and villages. But I suspect the Russian military planners would seek encouragement from the Battle of Kursk in 1944, where a deeply layered Soviet defence absorbed two large German armoured spearheads, destroyed them with counteroffensives, and then went over to the strategic offence so that's why it's quite difficult to predict how these dynamics could interact, because both sides get a vote and would fight to the death uh, to cast it. My impression on Ukrainian manpower is that there are still quite a significant number of adult males who have yet to be mobilised, but um, I'll ask Henry to add any detail he wants. I think it's worth pointing out, uh, that maybe stating the obvious, Ukraine's mobilised, the fact that Ukraine mobilised before Russia did, given them access to a, a larger pool of manpower for the, for the course of last year to the point where uh, Russia was really hurting in terms of the quanti quantitative balance of, of military capability towards the end of 2022 pre-mobilization. Um, I think Ukraine also got access to kind of what we call a notionally higher quality of manpower um, during the, uh, the, f the first phase of the conflict. Um, a number of their, a number of reservists who had served in um, various, various elements of the, of the kind of uh, attritional war in the Donbass from the 20, from 2014 to 2022, return to active service and return to units, um, and flesh that out. I think it is fair to say, however, one, that they have not suffered, that their, their casualty rate remains pretty high themselves, if not quite the same level the Russians have suffered, and that is a, that is going to be, that is a potential problem for them over the long term. I don't think Ukraine can afford the kind of brutal, of brutal kind of, um, it's, or squandering of manpower in the same way that Wagner have Wagner have undertaken in some of their recent most recent offensives, and I think that probably um, speaks to some of the reported desire from Western advisors to Ukrainian armed forces about um, switching uh, their, their kind of their offensive approach away from a more traditional kind of Soviet 
derived model to a to a Western combined arms approach in a may, maybe a kind of a less um, <laughs> a less risky uh, strategy in terms of manpower expenditure for them. Um, but at the same time, I don't think this is something that is going to impact them immediately in the short term. As Ben says, I think that for, uh, I think that for the next certainly for the next year, um, this isn't going to be a huge limiting factor on Ukrainian forces capability. Um, but it is, all, is one they will have to bear in mind in terms of their, their um, ability to spend blood and treasure. Um, James Hackett, I want to add something and then we'll take one more question. Thanks, John. Just very briefly, I mean, this does highlight the sort of mass versus capability question here. Um, Ukraine has mobilized, but still Russia is looking to mobilize more. And Ukraine did, as Henry said, have the advantage of people who are coming back in from the reserves that had been on the front line since 2014. However, they've also got to balance, uh, as the Russians do, um, broader economic contingencies. You need to keep the repair plants going. You need to keep specialists active in certain uh, economically useful sectors of the, of the war economy. Um, but on Western training, I think it's important to uh, consider the, the, the risks and the benefits from this. Risks, short term. You're having to push, through people, push people through uh, longer term training courses relatively quickly. Having said that, and this gets to the mass versus capacity and capability question, um, they're benefiting even in short terms from the fact that they are well motivated. Uh, people are coming here with a keen wish to defend their, their homeland. And also they're benefiting from Western uh, training uh, systems in terms of, let's say, mission command principles. And I think the, the Western training that was delivered to small Ukrainian units post-2014 gave them a, almost a, an asymmetric advantage when facing some of the Russian troops uh, coming down, certainly from the, the north, uh, in uh, uh, the early part of last year. And I don't think that should be underestimated. Bastian, one more question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to one that uh, actually, in one form or other, uh, six or seven people have, have posted online, which is about... Uh, uh, an increase in defense spending in Europe, an increase in demand in Europe, and the uh, defense industrial ability to absorb higher spending and higher uh, demand. And I'll, I'll ask Fenella to kick us off on that one. Sure, thank, thanks, Bastian. So with these increases, uh, these uplifts announcements that we've had um, over the course of 2022 in Europe, a lot of the focus has been on uh, defense capabilities, uh, acquisitions, procurement, uh, with these extra funds specifically focused on bolstering those investments as opposed to, say, investment in, in personnel or operations. It is looking at that industrial capacity and trying to bolster it. A uh, key example here is Poland, where the amount allocated to capital spending within the budget uh, increased, uh, will increase rather, to 40% next year from where from 30% that it's been over the last um, uh, previous five years. And that also isn't including this extra budgetary fund that we have for the Armed Forces Support Fund. So the extent to which that money can be absorbed within uh, European defence industry really depends on, on a number of factors that ultimately they're facing greater challenges now than they have done in the past in terms of uh, inputs, components, costs of materials. So while the money is welcome and will help to, um, to, to fund those increased acquisitions, it's whether they can actually... Um, find the sources of these supplies is, is the real challenge. It's the supply chain issue uh, that comes through. So even if you have that extra money, it's, it's, it becomes increasingly difficult to actually spend it. So what might happen in the short term is that countries will look to off-the-shelf purchases to um, increase that capacity. They might look at upgrades and modernization rather than uh, full-scale development that is, is increasingly expensive and harder to do domestically. Um, and finally, just uh, with these swift uh, increases, um, you know, there, were, there always has to, has to be that note of caution, as I say, with transparency and, and um, uh, accountability, but also in terms of um, the speed with which they're implemented and to ensure that there is no waste. It becomes uh, increasingly um, unforgivable, I suppose, in these times for, for, the, for these funds uh, to be spent um, ineffectively. So without a corresponding capability development plan, a year-by-year -year, um, allocation of targets as to where that funding will go, uh, does risk such funding uh, getting lost, not least to inflation, but also to inefficiencies.
Vanilla, thank you very much. So as the clock approaches 12, I think we'll close this session. Our communications department is ready to give a copy of the military balance 2023 to anyone who can prove that they are a media delegate in this room. Uh, the latest real-time information we have is that Amazon is selling the military balance 2023 at $679.64. So if you're lucky enough to pick one up, understand the savings that you're incurring. Thank you very much indeed.